भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येक्षजत्रा स्थिरंगुवागुम सस्तनो व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति नाक्षो अरिष्ट स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शांति 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 So in studying the Mandukya Upanishad I pointed out that the text is Mandukya Upanishad is embedded in a larger text called the Mandukya Karika The Upanishad belongs to the Vedas of course the Atharva Veda but the Karika was composed by Gaudapada who is Shankaracharya's teacher's teacher Karika is the commentary in verse form Now this commentary in verse form is divided into um four chapters we have completed the first chapter the first chapter includes the entire mandukya upanishad no big deal because the mandukya upanishad is very small only 12 mantras and some karikas some verses composed by gaudapada second chapter onwards second third and fourth chapters um they are composed only of the karikas they constituted of the karikas of gaudapada um the first chapter these chapters are called prakarana in sanskrit prakarana means uh, chapter or section chapter basically so the first chapter is called agama prakarana agama agama means literally it means the vedas but literally it means that which has come down so it has come down from it is revealed by god to the rishis and so on so agama first chapter so agama is a part is a, it's a revelation from uh, god to the rishis who first discovered it and um and it was transmitted down it has come down to us through an unbroken chain of uh teachers and students come 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 in come in come in sit down it has reached us through an unbroken chain of teachers and students there are other texts called agama also i mean you hear of shaiva agama uh, in the shaivai tradition there are vaishnava agamas there are tantra agamas shakta agamas in the tantric tradition so there are there are other texts called agamas but um, uh, the, here the agama means the veda so the vedic part of this text is the upanishad itself so strictly speaking the upanishad itself should be called the agama but because the mandukya upanishad of 12 mantras is embedded in the first chapter the first chapter itself is called agama prakarana because the chapter on the agama the agama in, refers to those 12 mantras in the chapter itself so agama prakarana we saw that 12 mantras plus a few verses composed by gaudapada now in this agama prakarana the most important mantra of the upanishad itself was the seventh mantra you know we we studied how the self has four aspects and the fourth aspect is called the turiya and the first three aspects being the waking dreaming and deep sleep selves the fourth aspect is the turiya the actual self the reality which is existence consciousness bliss and that was um described or at least indicated in the seventh mantra in the seventh mantra do you remember the seventh mantra na anta pragyam na bahish pragyam which is neither the dreamer nor the waker nor the deep sleep and so on in the seventh mantra 
two words are very important. One word is prapancha upashama. I poetically sometimes render it as the silence of the universe. It literally means, uh, sometimes it's translated as quiescence of the universe, the, the settling of the universe or cessation, um, prapancha upashama, cessation of the universe. This turiya is free from the universe. Take, uh, strictly speaking, the most direct translation will be the turiya, the fourth aspect of the self, is free from, is without the universe. Prapancha upashama. That is one word which is very important. And the next word which is very important, the second word which is very important in the seventh mantra is Advaitam, non-dual. This Turiyam, the fourth aspect of the self, so-called fourth aspect of the self is non-dual, Advaitam, non-dual. These two words are so important. Are people still coming? Let them come. <coughs> These two words are so important that Gaurapada actually wrote two whole chapters. The, he actually wrote two whole chapters about them. The second chapter is about this word Prapancha Upashama. I'm splitting it up. Prapancha Upashama. This word, meaning the cessation of the universe or free from the universe, this word itself is taken up and the whole chapter, Gaurapada writes a whole chapter on it, the second chapter, which we are going to start today. The second chapter is called Vaitatya Prakarana. Prakarana means chapter. So the second chapter is called Vaitatya Prakarana. And it, it deals with one word from the seventh mantra of the Upanishad, Prapanchopashama, free from the universe or the cessation of the universe. Basically, it deals with the falsity of the universe. You know, Advaita Vedanta proclaims Brahman alone is real, the world is an appearance, the world is false. So, what is this falsity of the universe? This is what puzzles many people. Why does Advaita insist on the falsity of the universe? What does it mean by the falsity of the universe? And more important, more and more important, is this chapter deals with, can we by reasoning, not just the Upanishad said the universe is, is an appearance, the, the self is actually free of the universe, but can we by reasoning um, demonstrate that the universe is an appearance, not just as a revelation, but by, by logic, by understanding, can, can we understand this falsity of the universe? So one way of dealing with it is, the Upanishad said so, that's fine. Another way of dealing with it is, when you are enlightened you will see. Well, that's also fine. But now, at this point, not by enlightenment, right now at this point, with our intellect, with our meager understanding, can we get a grasp on what is meant by the falsity of the universe and why? Reason, show us, by logic, by, by reasoning, that the universe is an appearance, it's false. So that is prapancha upashama, that's the word. And then, from there, the next word used was Advaitam. So for that, Gaurapada wrote another chapter, Advaita Prakarana, to explain the word Advaita. That's the third chapter, but that's ahead of us. And then there's a fourth chapter called Alata Shanti Prakarana. The, the third chapter is to use reasoning to prove the non-duality of the self that the ultimate reality is non-dual, there is no second reality apart from that, to prove that the third chapter was written. And the fourth chapter is basically a miscellany, uh, mainly deals with many other philosophical views and uh, it considers what has been taught from many, many angles. But it's a collection of many, many issues. I actually, the, the, the topic I'm going to speak about this Sunday, no mind, is drawn from the third chapter. It's two, come, come. It's two verses from the third chapter. Then, uh, a few weeks ago, I spoke on the second chapter. I, I gave a talk called The Ultimate Truth. That was a verse from the second chapter. So, I've sort of jumped ahead of what we are doing now. That was just based on one verse from, from this chapter, a very 
stunning verse towards the end of this chapter. And then there will be the fourth chapter, which is called Alata Shanti. It's a very Buddhistic term. Alata Shanti Prakarana. Quenching the firebrand or dousing the firebrand. The firebrand is an example used by the Buddhist. That if you take a firebrand, in, in Advaita also, if you take a firebrand, firebrand means like a, like a glowing charcoal, for example, um, like a dot of firelight, and you whirl it around, it looks like a continuous circle. It's an, uh, it's an optical illusion. It's all the time only a point of light, which is moving fast. So the Buddhist uses this example to uh, show that a continuously changing stream of consciousness. Uh, they do not accept one permanent unchanging consciousness. Con continuously changing, uh, continuously arising and disappearing stream of consciousness can seem to, can give the illusion of a continuous self. Um, so that's what they call it alata, uh, alata chakra. In fact, Shankaracharya also uses uh, this example in Aparokshanubhuti the whirling of the firebrand, but he uses it for something else, not for, obviously not to prove the Buddhist theory of the self. So these are the four chapters of Mandukya Karika. We have done the first one, and now we are on the second. All right. Before I enter into the second chapter, let me just dwell a little bit on this term, prapancha upashama, made up of two words, because this is what is going to be proved, so what is going to be discussed, let's just look at this term a little bit. Prapancha means universe. How does it come to mean the universe? Because pancha, literally it means five. Yes, it means the five elements. Basically the old cosmology was... Um, that the whole universe is composed of fire, earth, water, uh, space, air, uh, all of this, the five elements, and in mixtures they go to compose this universe, basically meaning that various combinations of matter and energy make up this universe. Uh, in principle, not different from the modern uh, approach, of, uh, of physicists' approach. Now, this universe, therefore, is, is basically the five elements in various combinations. So that's what it literally means. Prapancha means prakrishtena pancha, the five elements in various combinations. That's the universe. So that's like a shorthand way of describing the entire universe, the five elements. Now, in fact, one old Sanskrit term for dying, an old Sanskrit, I'm not, not so well known, but it's an old Sanskrit usage for dying is panchatvam gata, gone to the five. He has attained the five. It's a classical way of referring to death, which means the physical body has decomposed into the five elements. When you burn the body, after death, when the body is burned, um, the earth goes back to the earth, the space joins the space itself, uh, fire to, uh, heat to fire, uh, water to water, air to air, and so on and so forth. Basically, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Anyway, so... Prapancha refers to the universe. What, what does the universe mean? The universe means whatever you experience. Whatever we experience is the universe. That's how the Mandukya, this, this is the Mandukya framework of looking at the universe. Whatever you experience is the universe. What do you experience? You experience all of this. The universe means the waking universe. But you also dream about things. So there is the dream universe, there is the deep sleep universe. What do you mean by deep sleep universe? It's the way, basically the waking and dream universes merged into one, subject and object collapsed into one temporarily. So all three are included under the term universe. All three are included under the term universe. Another way of putting it would be, by universe is meant the gross universe, what you see here, the subtle universe, dream, not just dreams, thoughts, feelings, ideas, memories, the, the internal, private, first person universe each one of us has. That's also universe. And the causal universe, 
the way the Mandukya sees the deep sleep state as a causal state, as a merged state, as a potential state, as a seed state. Seed for what? Waking and dreaming. So, waking, dreaming, deep sleep means the waking universe, dream universe, deep sleep universe are um, sthula, sukshma, karana, prapancha. This gross, subtle and causal universes. Including, each of them includes the gross body, the subtle body and the causal body. These universes include this. This universe, for example, if you give an account, a description, an inventory of this universe, it includes this body. If you give a description of the mental universe, it includes the mind, our mental body. And the causal universe includes the causal body, the Anandamaya Kosha. All of that is Prapancha. Upashama. Upashama literally means free of, cease, uh, ceasing to be, uh, stopping, cessation. A more fancy English word is quiescence. Quiescence means silence or settling down. So, what they are saying is, this is free of or cessation. In the Turiya, the fourth aspect of the self, it is free of, there is no universe. The fourth aspect of the self, this pure consciousness, Turiya, there is no waking state, dream, there is no waking universe, dream universe or causal universe. It is free of the universe. And the fourth aspect is what you really are. So what you really are is free of the universe. This word basically, Upashama means negation of the universe. In Sanskrit, Nishedha. This term, Prapanch Upashama together, it means negation or Nishedha. A denial of the reality of the universe. A denial of the reality of the universe. Now you can see where, why this chapter is about the falsity of the universe. Prapanchopashama literally means a denial of the reality of the universe. A question arises here. What is it that is being denied? Or even better, what can be denied? What is it that you can deny? What, you can, what is it that you can negate? What is you, that you can say it, does, it is not? Let me break down the question a little further. Can you negate what exists or can you negate what does not exist? What is there? But I'm saying in a very simple way. Negation means it's not there. It's not. Now, if something is there, can you say that it's not there? It will be a false statement. It cannot be negated. What exists cannot be negated. And what does not exist need not be negated. You see, if it doesn't exist at all, if there's nothing like that, who will, why would you be bothered about negating it? A square circle. Why would you break your head about saying that there are no square circles? It's, it's a, no consequence. It's not there. It's not troubling you anyway. So what exists cannot be negated, cannot be denied. It will be, it'll be lie to say that it, it uh, doesn't exist. And what does not exist need not be uh, negated. Then the only thing that can be negated is something which, is, which cannot be said to either exist or not exist. How strange is that? What do you mean? The only thing that can be negated, only thing that is a fit subject. See, the second chapter is actually tougher than the first one. From now on, the going gets tough. Second, third, fourth chapters. Because now we are going to move, like the Kato Upanishad says, on the razor's edge. We, we have to be razor sharp to follow what Godapada is going to do. These are some of the, these are some really sharp cookies. So you have to be very careful, follow really close to them, step by step. He is going to take us into some very deep waters indeed. Before realization, before enlightenment, is going to make this entire universe disappear before your eyes. By the end of this chapter, you'll, <laughs> you'll be really scared as you go through this chapter. <laughs> yeah. He's going to absolutely erase the difference between dreams and waking. Just erase the difference. 
So, and it starts here. So, what can be denied, what can be negated is something is clearly not something, the truth cannot be denied and completely non-existence cannot be denied. It's like, what do you prove to be false? When you say, if somebody told the truth, you can't prove it to be false because it's the truth. If somebody keeps silent, you can't prove anything to be false. He didn't say anything. It's only when somebody tells a lie that you can prove it to be false. Correct? Only lies can be proved to be false. Yes? Okay, we are coming there. <laughs> you are in direct line with, you are in, channeling your inner Gaudapada. <laughs> what she said was, in that case, what can be negated and what we are going to negate is something that does not exist and yet appears to exist. Uh -huh. So, when yeah. you say it does not exist, what, what do you, let's say, give, can you cite an example? Good. Again, the inner God of Father. Then the very next thing I was going to give is a barrage of examples. <laughs> All right. Now, let's say, what a strange thing. It does not exist, but appears to exist. Do we know of any such thing? Its world is full of such things. World is full of such things. For example, the classic Advaitic example of the rope snake, <laughs> where the rope appears to be a snake, and at that moment, you are perfectly, perfectly convinced it's a snake. It even scared you. Now, that needs correction. It's an error. It's an error, right? It needs correction. What you see there, by mistake, by entirely by your mistake, it will be good to correct it. That correction is this Upashama negation he's speaking about. You make an error and that is corrected. You see something that is not there. You're seeing a snake which is not there. There may be snakes in the zoo, but it's not there. It's a rope. Water in the mirage. So Swami Vivekananda, the famous story, is going in the desert in Rajasthan and he sees water, he's very thirsty and he goes to drink the water and he sees it's a mirage. Not only that, at least the snake in the rope disappears when you see it. You realize it's not there. But mirage water, when he walks further and he looks back, he sees water. But what has happened in between? What has happened in between is, though he sees it, Upashama has happened. It has ceased to be water. So, the mirage water is, he knows it now. It has been corrected, it has been denied, it has been negated. That water in the mirage has been negated now. Though it continues to appear. Appearance cannot be stopped. It's a matter of optics. Optical illusion. It cannot be stopped. But what can be stopped is the wrong idea that there is water there. There is no water there. What is not there appears to be there. That is the essence of error. Shankaracharya in, the, in his famous Adhyasa Bhashya, he says, um, uh, he says, uh, the, the uh, essence of uh, error, he, Adhyasa, he, he calls it, um, that which is not there, when it appears to be there, that is the essence of error. I forget the exact uh, Sanskrit, very nice, short, pithy term. Ekanta mm. Bhava? No. Uh, easier than that. <laughs> uh, he says, um, I'll come back. Um, so, negation means you are negating something which is not there but appears to be there. Mi the water in a mirage. Dreams. What happens when you wake up? Oh, it was a dream. Unless you are Janaka, King Janaka, <laughs> where you go into <laughs> philosophical tangles. But otherwise, when you wake up, you say, Oh, I was dreaming. I was safe and, safe and sound in my um, uh, bed. Uh, all that was, I saw that those people, those places, those events, they are all not there, though I saw them. When you wake up from a dream, you don't say, I did not see a dream. You say, I saw it, but it was a dream. It was a dream means it did not happen really. So, this is the denial of something which appears, but is not there. Yes. So, every error has to have a basis of reality? Yes. And if it is not an error, it cannot exist? No, no. <laughs> if, it, if it is not an error, it exists. It exists. And what is, what you are right, you have pointed out something important. What she said is, every error must have a basis of reality. If you are saying something is a lie, then below it must be truth. 
if you say this currency is forged, this is a good example. It's a, for, it's a forgery. It's not a real uh, dollar bill or a rupee bill. That means there must be some real currency to compare it with. All currencies cannot be forged. Only because there's something real you're saying compared to that, this is false. Now, she says that every error must have a basis in truth. It is the truth misrepresented, misunderstood, misperceived, which you call an error. Okay. This is what Advaita is saying, basically. If there is an error, there must be truth behind it. The very fact that the world is called an error in Advaita, we'll see. We have, we have not proved it. That's, what's, that's, that's the whole subject matter of second chapter. This world is called an error. Our perception, universe is going to be negated, is called an error, means that there is a truth behind it. Not an unconnected truth. That's the, at the basis of this error, there must be truth. At the basis of the false snake, there must be the real rope. Uh, at the basis of the blue sky, there must be the colorless sky, the real sky without any color. So, uh, Brahman, the reality, is here and now and this itself, misperceived as this world. That's an important point. In fact, this is just a little bit out of the way, but it's, um, Shankaracharya uses this language in the Brahma Sutra Bhashya, where he takes up different schools of thought for refutation. So when he comes to the Buddhist school of, um, he refutes other Buddhist schools. There are many Buddhist schools. He refutes other Buddhist schools in detail. Vigyanavada, the school of momentary consciousness, he refutes in detail, page after page. But when he comes to Shunyavada, the school of the void, Shankaracharya refutes it in one sentence. Not because it can; it's easy to refute in one sentence, but because he seems to be strangely sidestepping the issue. He just says, Vigyanavada, uh, um, Shunyavada, the school of the void, that ultimately everything is Shunyam. Shankaracharya refutes it by just, just saying one sentence, that we do not accept error without truth. Navayam niradhara brahmangi kurmaha. Literally it means, we do not accept an error without bottom. Like a bottomless well, it can't be a bottomless well. A well, no matter how deep, it's not going to go through the earth and come out on the other side. At one point, it comes to a ground. So, the bottom of this error of this universe is Brahman. It's the ground on which this thing appears. It's the rope on which the snake of, of the universe appears. He dismisses it. And scholars have caught that. You see, they have said that Actually, the, the Madhyamika school, the school of Shunyavada, is so close to Advaita Vedanta that he dared not examine it too, too closely. Because then the game will be up. Because if you try to refute it too closely and examine it too closely, you will reveal your own philosophy, basically. And they are the same, almost the same. It seems to be, from one point of view. And also, just to be fair, the school of Shunyavada does not say that it's all error. That's uh, often... Both the Hindus and the Buddhists have sort of misrepresented or caricatured each, each other's point of view to refute it. But if you examine Shunyavada deeply enough and if you examine Advaita deeply enough, the parallels become very clear. They are not saying exactly the same thing, but they are saying almost like mirror images. <coughs> All right. But back to our Prapanchopashama. Now we said something rather stunning. What you can deny is not the truth, because you cannot deny the truth. What exists cannot be denied. What exists in Vedanta is called Sat, that which is Sat, that which does not exist at all. The classic, uh, in classical Sanskrit, the examples they gave is Kapushpa, a sky flower, a flower in the sky. Um, uh, or they say the Bandhyaputra, the son of a barren woman. By logic, by definition itself, there can be no son. Either then the woman is a mother or um, uh, the, the son cannot exist. So these are examples of asat, not existing at all. So neither sat can be denied nor asat. Asat need not be denied. What can be denied is neither the existent nor the non-existent. Is something apart from the existent and the non-existent. In Sanskrit, sat Asadbhyam anirvachaniyam, that which cannot be designated as sat or asat. 
this is the definition of the term mithya in sanskrit this is mithya always you know we say brahma satyam jagat mithya brahman is real and and the world is false that's the english translation the precise sanskrit word is mithya note that it does not say the world does not exist it does not say the world does not exist it says the world is mithya what is mithya that which cannot be said to exist or not to exist why cannot it be said uh, to exist because of, upon realization or when you study the upanishad or when we shall see by reasoning in this chapter we shall see it really does not exist but why can you not say that it does not exist because it appears it is experienced we are dealing with it all the time we are living in it huh? so our entire waking universe and dream universe and deep sleep that merged darkness of deep sleep all of it is mithya this is the proposition what we are going to deal with in this chapter mithya neither existent in fact vedanta says the only thing that really exists is turiya the fourth the brahman the ultimate reality the absolute that's the only thing that exists nor is it entirely non existent because it appears so all of them the gross universe the subtle universe and the causal universe including the gross body the subtle body and the causal body all of it stars and planets protons and neutrons human beings and whales and dolphins and uh, all of this and all of what you dream about all of it is is mithya and appearance there is a truth there there is a grounding of truth there that which appears in this way the truth is turiya or brahman and the appearance is the world that's what they're trying to say this can be negated this can be negated this is that is the premise that is what the promise is we are going to show you how it can be negated negation of a So, uh, snake seen in a rope is easy to understand negation of a um, uh, water of water in the mirage is easy to understand negation of an optical illusion like uh, say the blue color in the sky is easy to understand even dreams you wake up and you see how it is negated what is meant by negation of this world uh, how to prove this to be mithya one is already upanishad has said it now by reasoning we are going to by logic we are going to see this what else did i want to say okay if this is mithya now what she said is there must be a ground of truth to it what is the truth remember what has been called mithya waker dreamer deep sleeper waker's universe dreamer's universe deep sleeper's universe all are mithya ha huh. then what is the truth turiya ah turiya the fourth one is the truth 1 2 3 fourth one is truth turiya what it is saying is what what's happening she just read oh okay fine come 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 join us just um, give them some space to sit yeah you can come here too come up here there's a lot of space here you've got some premium seating here <laughs> come sit sit the fourth is the truth turiyam is the truth the 1 2 3 the four the three padas the three aspects of the self the waking aspect the waking self dream self and deep sleep self and the respective universes they are not the truth they are appearance the fourth alone is the truth if 1 2 3 are not real they are appearances and the fourth alone is the, is is reality then the fourth becomes non dual fourth becomes non dual why non dual because there is no second thing apart from the from the fourth apart from the turiyam there is no second thing apart from the turiyam what were the what is the other possibility waking dreaming deep sleep but they are not real that's the that's the um, that's the uh, proposition we are going to show that if they are not real then the turiyam becomes without a second without a second in sanskrit advaitam non dual are you with me so far the turiyam becomes non dual why is the turiyam non dual didn't i just say 
four aspects of the self. There is a physical universe, there is a subtle universe, there is a causal universe. No, if they are neither real nor non-unreal, they cannot be counted with the real. You cannot count the mithya with the satyam. You cannot count the appearance with the reality. You win the lottery and you are happily counting the dollar bills and then suddenly you wake up. Now, the, what you counted in your dream, the thousands of dollars you have stacked nicely. When you wake up, you cannot add it to your existing wealth. That so much I counted, so much, and now I can go on. You liked a cookie and ate a cookie, and then you, uh, in the dream you ate three more. And when you wake up next day, you said, I have overdosed on sugar, I ate four cookies. No. Luckily, you cannot count the three dream cookies with the cookie you ate the night before going to sleep. So, the, the real thing cannot be counted along with the, with the, with the d dream, uh, um, dream entities, whatever you dreamt about. So all of these should not be counted with Turiyam. If these cannot be counted with Turiyam, then Turiyam becomes one. one. Huh. And yet they appear, follow this carefully, yet they appear. So what appears and yet cannot be counted separately from Turiyam, the only thing you can say is Advaitam, not two. The Turiyam is the reality, the Turiya is the reality and all of these, they are not real, they appear. If they appear and are not real, the only thing you can say is they must be in some sense the Turiyam itself, they are not ap apart from it, they are not separate entities from it. So, not two. It's like, if that sounds too um, abstract, very simple way of understanding. Uh, the, our classic gold and uh, ornament example. Uh, imagine the bracelet is the waking, the necklace is the dream, the ring is the, um, uh, the <coughs> deep sleep and gold is the turiyam. Now, the three ornaments are not apart from the gold, right? From the point of view of the gold, can you count one ornament, two ornaments, three ornaments and gold is the fourth ornament, can you count? No, you cannot count. You cannot count. If you are counting ornaments, how many are there? Three. If you are counting the substance itself, how many are there? One. Only a few seem to be... <laughs> one only. There is only one. What is that one? Gold. Then let me ask you the question, what about those three ornaments? With respect to the gold, what are they? Non-dual. They are not second other than gold. Other than gold, you cannot say gold plus one more thing called necklace, gold plus a second thing called uh, ring. No. You have to say gold itself. Why can you not count them apart from the gold? Because you cannot show them apart from the gold. Mm. This podium, the wood and the podium. Wood and the podium. Can I say that there are two things here? I use two words, wood and podium. So can I say there are two things here? No. no. Is only because I cannot show them separately. So the podium is, non is not a second thing apart from the wood. Similarly, ornaments are not second, is not a second thing apart from gold. Similarly, the entire universe which we experience is not a second thing apart from Turiyam. Therefore, Turiyam is Advaitam. The universe is not Advaitam. Turiyam is Advaitam. The ornaments are not non-dual. There are three kinds of ornaments or many kinds of ornaments. But gold is non-dual with respect to all those ornaments. Turiyam is non-dual with respect to everything that we experience. Gross universe, subtle universe, deep sleep universe. Not only that, the selves which we experience in waking, the waking self, dream self, deep sleep self, they are also, non, they are also not a second one apart from the Turiyam, the real self. There is a little contradiction here. What is the contradiction? You could say, Swami, look at the language you are using. You are, you, you are saying the Turiyam is non-dual, not two. But literally the word Turiyam means number four. You are saying number four is not two. How can it be number four if there is no two? You can say it is one and not two. Ekam eva advitiyam. It is one and without a second. That is the classic Advaitic exam. But if you are saying four is without a second, it must have been one and two and three and then only four. So how are you saying the fourth one is without a second? Do you see the contradiction? 
you're saying Turiya means fourth. Why is it fourth? Because uh, we have shot ourselves in the foot. We started with four aspects of the self and the fourth aspect is the Turiya. Now you're going, uh, you're saying the fourth one is without a second. How can it be fourth? Just for the, if somebody raises such a question. How can you call it fourth if there is no one, two, three? Just How can you? Make a point. That's uh, why we have one, two, three. Uh, yes. Remember again back to the seventh mantra of the Upanishad. Chaturtham Manyante. It says it is thought to be the fourth. And the commentator says, thought by whom? Says, Agyaha, the ignorant think of it as the fourth. Uh, when, you, when we are studying Vedanta, we are accustomed to the waking self. That guy who is studying Vedanta is the waking self. Also, we know our dream selves. We also can sort of conceive of our deep sleep self. And in respect to these three, we are, we are trying to find out what the Upanishad is pointing at, the fourth aspect. That is called the fourth, with respect to one, two, three. But now the one, two, three are proved to be not separate realities. They are all appearances of that fourth. So there is no one, two, three. Just as you cannot count the dream cookies, you cannot count the dream money, you cannot count one, two, three. If you are going to count reality, you have to count only Turiya. If you are going to count the experienced selves, you can count waking, dreaming and deep sleep. But just like the ornaments, when you count gold, you cannot count the three ornaments anymore. Because the three ornaments are made of that gold, right? Are you with me? Yeah. Why it is not called, why fourth is not really fourth? <coughs> uh, it is the only one. It's the only one. Those who are enlightened, meaning you, you have come, those who have completed first chapter, you know fourth doesn't mean fourth. When people are new, newbies are coming, you can say that, wait for it, F fourth is fourth, oh yeah, only for you guys, but uh, once you finish it, there is no fourth. <coughs> there is only one without a second, Turiyam without any second, Ekam Eva Dvitiyam, and that's the language used in Chandogya Upanishad, Ekam Eva Dvitiyam, one only without a second, one only without a second, three terms are used, there is a meaning to that. So these three are appearances, the reality is Turiyam. This turiyam is in and through all of them. Just like the rope is, where is the rope? In and through the snake. Hmm. Where is the mirage? Where you see the water itself. Yeah. Now nothing has been proved so far. This thing is what the Upanishad wants us to understand. Now Gaudapada says, I can show it to you through reasoning. Hmm. Shankaracharya also, he gives a commentary there. When he starts the second chapter, he says, what we learnt about the appearance of the universe, Agama Matram Tat, he says, that is, that is the revelation of the, that, that is Upanishad itself, pure Upanishad. But what about reasoning? What about knowledge? What about understanding it? Can we understand it? One way I've seen senior monks tell us, all right, let it be right now, when you realize it, you will see. Okay, well, <laughs> but what about now? Can we understand it? Gaudapada says, yes, we have to reason about it. Before we get into the reasoning, all right. Before we start reasoning, let me talk about reasoning a little bit. What is meant? We keep talking about logic and reason, but there is a very precise meaning of logic and reason when they talk about it. I'll give you a very quick idea of it before we start. So this, oh, one more point here. So prapanchopashama, the free from the universe, negation of the universe, that's the topic here. Prapanchopashama, another meaning, another name for that is mithya, falsity. Falsity of what? Falsity of the universe. So falsity of the universe is the topic. Another term for falsity is vitatha. That's where the chapter gets its name. Vitatha literally means, tatha means, like that, as such. And vitatha means not as such. Not, not what it looks to be. Tatha means it is what it looks to be. Vitatha means it's not what it seems to be. That is the meaning of falsity. It's not what it, that, that's how um, Advaita, when Advaita says world is false, it means that. That it's not what it seems to be. 
vitatha vitatha means unreal not not what it seems to be and vaitathyam the name of the chapter is the noun vitatha is the adjective vaitathyam is the noun is the is the um, unreality so unreal unreality the chapter on unreality remember the chapter is not unreal it's a chapter is, is about the unreality of the universe mithya mithya means false the chapter is not false it's about the falsity of the universe all right now a little uh, fast very fast tutorial on reasoning on lo- on logic so th- many of you might know those who have been trained in logic for them it is nothing but many of you might know that there is a subject called logic and uh, there is a whole science to it and these days especially it's a very sophisticated subject and it basically forms the the ba- very basis of um, our whole it computer science and everything uh, but it's an ancient subject prevalent in both the east and the west in the west the basis is what is called aristotelian logic greek logic long before i became a monk i had a, i had this subject back in school logic so we learned a lot about aristotelian logic greek logic which is at the basis of western uh, logic of course modern logic is very sophisticated it's called mathematical logic symbolic logic which developed in the 18th 19th centuries and all. It's, it's really sophisticated it's the basis of all our computer science information science and all there is also indian logic uh, the science of reasoning in indian philosophy which is called nyaya so today nyaya nyaya means nyaya is a branch of philosophy and this philosophy is they, they are specialists in reasoning nyaya the practitioners of nyaya are called nayayikas so you will know it when you meet one they'll argue you to the death <laughs> they'll dispute anything and everything uh, but they developed the science of logic in india nyaya so we like our philosophy is called vedanta and uh, practitioners are called vedanti now we use nyaya every school of philosophy in india whether they are buddhists or uh, yogis or sankhyans or vedantins or purvamima any of the schools they all borrow on the techniques developed by nyaya nyaya has its own conclusions nyaya if you, if you look at the nyaya philosophy i had the occasion to study it um, when we are trained to be monks that's one of the philosophies we study as at an introductory level but i had the chance to study it under a good teacher a pandit of nyaya i took three advanced courses in nyaya um why did i mention that okay the conclusions of nyaya philosophy apart from the techniques of logic the conclusions of nyaya philosophy are very different from vedanta they're very different in fact they are much closer to common sense they don't say world is false they say world is very real they don't say there's one reality they say there in fact there are many realities uh they are much closer to i would say a common sense view of reality or even a modern materialist scientific view of reality so, nyaya vaisheshika another school is vaisheshika so these people they use logic now let me give you the basic form of argument that's all we need to know we are not going to study nyaya here but we just going to know the how the nyayikas argue because then you will know what gaudapada gaudapada also uses the nyaya form of argument in fact everybody in ancient india did all the they were like mortal enemies of the nayayikas the advaitins buddhists they're all enemies philosophically speaking of the nayayikas but they use the techniques they use those resources so what is the basic way the nayayikas argue to understand that i'll give you to in comparison the basic way the um, say aristotelian logic works and then compare it with the nyaya logic very simple way the classic syllogism the form syllogism is a form of argument classic syllogism in aristotelian aristotelian logic is um all men are mortal this is the example we had to learn all men are mortal socrates is a man 
and so Socrates is mortal. So this is the logic. All men are mortal. Statement one. And there are technical names for them, major premise and minor premise and conclusion. Um, <coughs> Socrates is a man. So these two are given to you. From reasoning from these two, what is the conclusion that you will reach? The conclusion that you will reach is therefore, tell me, Socrates is mortal. Is mortal. This is called a syllogism in Aristotelian logic. And there are many, many forms of the syllogism. I think there are 14 or 15 forms of the basic syllogism which we we'll memorized when we were kids. I've forgotten. They're all interesting names like Barbara and Celerant and Dimaris. I, I still remember some of them. They have, be, uh, yeah. Would, wouldn't a more basic one be, I think, therefore I am? That, is that the most basic? No, that's the most basic um, way of proving that this, everything depends on thinking, the conscious self. Well, yeah, that's, yeah. that's interesting because you can negate that because uh, I doesn't exist. Uh, Brahman exists, but I... Is yeah, that, all that comes later. That, that, okay, that, okay. Yeah, that's the form you're, you're talking... Me now, yeah. so. No, this is, the, and this, this is uh, logic 101. This is what you learn, forget uh, uh, Vedanta uh, or even advanced philosophy. If you go to a logic class, this is the f example they will use. They will not use I think, therefore I am, because that's a, actually not so basic. That's a pretty sophisticated mm -hmm. conclusion that Descartes reached. It's not something that you can teach school children. Because, it's a, <laughs> because a whole... whole yeah, that's true. Yeah. So it's a conclusion which Descartes reached up in his project of doubting everything. And he ended up by saying that I cannot doubt my own existence. Because after all, the, who is doing the doubting if I, um, if I deny myself? The cogito ergo sum the, of, of Descartes. But this is the example which is used to teach kids logic. And then you go on into various kinds of uh, forms of this. There are different forms of this. Then there are fallacies. There are, there, there are, there are uh, um, lot of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of fallacies are there, different kinds of fallacies, and you find them in the dialogues of Socrates. Uh, so it's very old, more than 2,000 years old in Greek logic. So this is the form. Now, what is the Indian form of this? Similar, but very interestingly different also. And then I will tie it up by showing why I'm saying this in this context. This gives you basically the um, whole strategy of Gaudapada, what he's going to do. What is the Indian form? Again, the basic form which we were taught as students of logic. Uh, in Sanskrit, it goes this way. Parvato vannimad, parvato vannimad, dhumavatvat, or dhumat. Yes. Yatra yatra dhumaha, tatra tatra vannhi. Yatha mahanase. What does it mean? There is fire on the hill because there is smoke. Wherever there is smoke, there is fire. And you see, that sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah, that's the phrase in English too. Wherever there is smoke, there is fire. As in the kitchen. Now here is the difference between you know, Western logic and Indian logic. In Indian logic, the way you do it is, first, there is something to be proved. You have to ask, what do you want to prove? What? We want to prove fire. Where do you want to prove it? We want to prove it on the hill. There is fire on the hill. Then you have to answer why? By what reason? What reason are you giving to say that there is fire on the hill? Yes. How will you prove it? Smoke. There is smoke. How do you know there's smoke? You saw it. You say, no, but I can see the fire also. In that case, you don't have to prove it. You've seen it. See, proving this is called inferential knowledge, not perceptual knowledge. If you have perceptual knowledge, the principle is you don't have to use inference. Right? It's like if you sign when you come in here, if you sign on a sheet when you come in here, and I can see you there. Now, let me see. Let me 
find out whether you are here or not. Will I say, I see you, therefore you are here. Or will I go to the register and see your name is there, so you must be here. No, I have seen you. So I don't have to infer from some other data that you are here. If you see the fire, you don't have to prove it. it already your senses have shown, revealed it to you. But if you do not see it, then you have to prove it. This is the basic method which is used in science. When you collect data, a lot of the things that you talk about in science are not visible to the senses. You can't see it, smell it, hear it, taste it, touch it. But you have extraordinary instruments, powerful instruments, which can de detect the extraordinarily tiny and the extraordinarily vast also, uh, or the distant ones. And based on the data, you make an inference. You already have a hypothesis. Then you make an inference which can prove or disprove your hypothesis. But basically inferential knowledge is like this. So you want to use, you have to say because of the smoke. I see the smoke, therefore there is fire. And then one more question you ask, which is peculiar to Indian logic. You have to ask like what? Give an example. Say like the kitchen or the stove or something. What is this like what? Where have you seen this phenomenon earlier? Yeah. That you say wherever there is smoke, there is fire. Where have you seen it? How do you know that wherever there is smoke, there is fire? You must have seen it. You must have seen both of them together sometime at least to establish that link. That link is vital. It's called Vyapti. The link between what and why. Fire and smoke. That link is vital. You see, the whole system will not work without, without that link. There is fire on the hill. See, there is fire. Where? On the hill. Why? How do you know? Because I see smoke. What's the relation? Wherever there is smoke, there is fire. How do you know? Because I saw it in the kitchen. I saw both of them together. That's how this works. Let me give you the Sanskrit terms. What you want to prove is called sadhya. Sadhya. Where you want to prove it is called paksha. You can't say, it's like the fire, fire station here. If they see a smoke coming out, uh, from an uh, apartment here on, on the 72nd, uh, it happened a few weeks ago. The smoke pouring out from an apartment in the 72nd uh, street. So there is a smoke there and therefore there must be fire. But where? I can't rush off to the 80th street because I saw smoke on the 72nd street. No, you have to go there where the smoke is coming out. I, I want, I'm proving that there is fire in that apartment on the 72nd street. So where is an important word? Where is an important term? Why? Why do you say there is fire? Because you are seeing smoke. So, this is called Hetu. Hetu means cause, reason. Why? And then example, Drishtanta. Drishtanta means example. So, these are the components of the Indian syllogism. And it's very similar to the Greek syllogism. And they are about contemporary, little, the Indian system might be a little older. It's called Gautama's Nyaya Sutras. Like in Vedanta, Brahma Sutras are there. Uh, in Nyaya also there is. In fact, many people do not know, because it's only academic now, pundits and scholars study it. Many people do not know the literature on Nyaya is actually larger than the literature on Vedanta. There are more. Say, so for example, the introductory text we study when we start Vedanta is called Vedanta Sara. Introductory text we study is called Vedanta Sara. It has three well-known commentaries and a few other not so well-known commentaries. Three well-known commentaries to my knowledge. I mean, see, the, the tradition is there is a text and there are sub-commentaries. Just like this one which we are studying, the original text is Mandukya Upanishad. Commentary on that? Karika. Mandukya Karika. Commentary on that? Shankara's commentary. And there are sub-commentaries also <coughs> like that. So a standard text to learn Vedanta is Vedanta Sara. And it has three commentaries, which shows how much it has been studied and commented upon. The standard text to learn Nyaya is called Tarka Sangra. Literally, it means a collection of arguments. So you can know what the tendency of those people. To my knowledge, I have a list of 80 commentaries, 80 commentaries written on it in Sanskrit, on that one 
simple introductory text. So it shows the, the how much these people, they, they, how much they argued. <laughs> I have one of my teachers, Vedanta teachers, a monk. He was also trained in Nyaya. He's not argumentative. He's the sweetest man you can uh, <laughs> imagine. But he has this funny sayings, you know, for example, Yatra Nayaika Santi, Yatra Kaka Pinavasanti, which means where, where the logicians reside, even crows cannot stay there. The crows, you know, they're always cackling and cawing and all, and the logicians put them to shame because they, they, they quarrel so much that the crows fly away. They're, I give up, I can't stay with these guys. And they're, they're, all the time they're quarreling. An example. It's funny, that's why I'll tell you. Um, you know, when we st start these texts, we do a chant. Mm -hmm. So we do a chant. And the logicians being logicians, even in, even in their text, when they started, there's a chant. But being logicians, when you do the chant, the first thing is, why? <laughs> I said, why? Just do a chant, it's nice. No, why? Why do a chant? Why, why, why should we not start it without doing a chant? And then, see, the answer is, you see how, it, how they argue. The answer is, that traditionally the chant is done because um, um, uh, to, to, to two purposes. One is to remove all obstacles and one is for the successful completion of the text. So to remove all co obstacles for the su successful completion of the text. The author does it so that the author can finish the text. The text can do well, it can be a bestseller or whatnot. Uh, they didn't have New York Times list in those days, but some, some texts became more popular than others. And the student does it so that we can finish studying. God knows that we shouldn't die before the text is completed. So successful completion of the text, overcoming all obstacles, that's the purpose of the chant. You pray to God. The Nayaika won't let you go so easily. He'll say, but there are so many texts which were successfully completed and there are no chants associated with them. So many people write books, there are no chants there. And there are so many texts, which there are in the museums, you'll see manuscripts, which begin with a nice chant, but the text was never completed. So your uh, argument that the, the chant helps you to complete the text, that is falsified in both ways. There are complete texts without chants and there are texts with nice chants and not completed. Then the answer to that will be, all this is of no use, but I'm just showing you what happens. The answer to that will be that uh, the texts which have chants but were not completed, they had many obstacles in their past karma, so they should have chanted more. <laughs> <laughs> and the texts which were completed um, without any chant, well, they had chanted in their past lives, you know, a lot of chanting, so the effects are there in the present life. This goes on, and at one point, this line of reasoning is abandoned, but they come to useful conclusions. The, you know, in this, this whole, this is called Mangala Vichara, an analysis of the chanting at the beginning. What conclusion do they finally come to? The conclusion they finally come to is wonderful. It's really common sense and really uh, worthwhile. You know what conclusion they come to? We chant because it's the cultural thing to do. <laughs> it's, good, it's, it's good form, part of good culture, to chant at the beginning of a class. That's why we do it. Even then they won't let go. So then chant it in your mind. Why loudly? So, because, so that the next generation of students can also learn it. That's why it's done loudly. That's the final conclusion they have. So this is how they go on. Just one more point here before I go ahead. The unique thing about the Indian form, the Nyaya form, is the Drishtanta, this example. This is not there in the Greek form. Now this has two consequences. One bad and one good. Logicians have argued, modern logicians and mathematicians have argued that um, this will make sense to those who study mathematics and logic. That at one time Greek logic became in the West a basis for development of mathematical logic of higher order logics. An argument about an argument. A syllogism about a syllogism. Second order logic, third order logic. But you could not do that so easily in Nyaya because this is rooted to the world. You must show me an example in the world. So if you try to make an abstract argument about this, it becomes a little difficult. Then you have to use another argument as an example. So the uh, problem was that this form of argumentation prevented the development of 
higher order logic in India. That's one argument. How far it's true, we don't know. But the advantage is, one interesting thing I saw recent, some recent development in logic is that they found a use for it in robotics. What happens is, abstract logic, it seems, doesn't work for a machine which has to deal with the real world. The machine helps. It, 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 works, it works on a heuristic principle, a sort of um, make mistakes and learn principle. So if you can program it with a lot of real world examples, this is so because of that, just like such and such thing. So it will keep, it, its logic thinking will be rooted to the world, to the environment. It's connected to the environment. Its reasoning is connected to the environment. So I was just thinking something developed 3000 years ago, where they couldn't have even thought about uh, robots. It's finding its use in today's world. Yeah. What you're basically saying is, uh, what do you think? That's actually the basis of entire artificial intelligence. Yes, a whole artificial intelligence here. They are finding this, this approach much more useful. Anyway, now, let's apply to Vedanta. All this is just by preparation. So the Nayaikas developed a whole system of logic. It's a vast system, very interesting, very complicated, very sophisticated. Before the development of modern mathematical logic, it was the most intricate system. Swami Vivekananda says in the complete works, the most intricate, sophisticated system of, I'm paraphrasing, of reasoning ever developed by, by uh, mankind is in the ancient uh, Indian system of logic. <coughs> now we apply it to, um, to Vedanta. What is Gaudapada doing? What does he want to prove? Falsity, right? Mithyatva, falsity. Where the waking world Specifically the universe, I mean um, in general the universe, but what we are interested in is the waking world. What do we consider to be real? This one. We are really not bothered about the, about the dream world because we know it, we all accept it's a dream. But this world is false. The waking world, he wants to prove that there is falsity here. This is false. Why? This is the whole chapter. It will come slowly. It will come in the fifth or sixth verse. Why? What is the reason? And... Like what? Like what? So, dream, yes. Gaudapada will use the dream example. An example is something that everybody should agree upon. I want to prove that there is fire on the hill because there is smoke. Now, this will work for you only if you agree that wherever there is smoke, there is fire. So, I want to give you an example where we both agree that we have seen smoke and fire. So I say just like a, like the kitchen where we saw smoke and fire. But it will not be modern Indian kitchen where smokeless chula will be there. <laughs> Remember, wherever there is smoke, there is fire. The opposite is not true. You have to, that's why logic, you have to be very careful. Wherever there is fire, there is smoke. No, no, no. There are examples like in your, say, cooking range, for example. Smokeless. And in India, they are making stoves. Because the village stoves which uh, people use for cooking are very unhealthy. They generate a lot of smoke. So smokeless chulla they call it. Uh, oven, smokeless ovens. Now you have fire there but no smoke. So fire and smoke do not go together always. But smoke and fire go together always. Smoke is generated by fire. So if we are agreed on the example. In the kitchen we, sh we saw smoke and fire together. Now we are seeing smoke coming from that apartment or that hill. Therefore, can we agree that there, is, there must be fire there, though we can't see it. Now we have to race out there with a fire, fire engine and all of that. Just like that, what is an example we will agree on? We will agree on the dream example. The dreams are, what we saw in dreams are false. Um, if you agree, then Gaudapada is going to prove that just like a dream, this waking world is also false. What is he going to prove? What? Falsity. Like fire. Where? Waking world. Like the hill. Like what? Kitchen here? Dream. What is the reason? That is the crucial thing. I'm not, I put a blank here. Why is it false? So that is the thing to be understood which we will go into uh, in the next few verses.
Now this will work, this like, it will work only if you agree on this, this example. There always will be a guy who will say that, but dreams are also true sometimes. So that's why Gaudapada starts his second chapter because he's going to use the dream example to prove something dramatic that this waking world is also like a dream. It's also an appearance. It's also mithya, false. Before that, he wants to make sure we are all on the same page. So he is going to spend a couple of verses in the beginning to show that dreams are false. You might say, yeah, I agree, dreams are false. Go ahead. He said, no, 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 not so fast. One reason is there might be some uh, peculiar guy, obstinate guy who will say, no, dreams are true. We have to make provision for that. We have to convince that guy. And the second thing is, even all of us, we agree dreams are false, but we have not thought it through philosophically. We accept it, dreams are false. But why? If you are pushed into a corner, tell me why dreams are false. Please enumerate the reasons. Why do you think dreams are false? So we, have, we must move in philosophy, small steps but steady steps. Build up a case. So the first two verses will be, three verses will be, he will argue, you might say it's a fruitless argument. We accept the premise that dreams are false. But let's just see why dreams are false. So let's start. So this was an introduction to the second chapter. What is going to happen? And the inner working. This is the procedure that he's going to follow. This is the, I can say, the DNA of the creature which is in front of you now. Uh, so this, this is, he's going to generate the reason. This one. This is the chapter. Of course, Later on, he will give some spiritual advice also. So if the world is false and you understand it, now what does it mean for your spiritual life? Those things also will come. But first, this one. The main, the, uh, the, the substance of the chapter is that why is the world false? First of all, because it's like a dream, dream is false. How? First verse. Vaitatyam sarvabhavanam Vaitatyam sarva bhavanam Swapna ahur manishinaha Manishinaha Antasthanatu bhavanam Antasthanatu bhavanam Sangritatve na hetuna Sangritatve na hetuna So we are taking up the dream first. Why are we taking up the dream example first? Because he is going to use that as an example in his Nyaya syllogism, the argument which is building up to show that the waking world is also an appearance, like a dream. Now, in the dream, in Swapna, Swapna means in the dream, all things are said to be false. Everything that you experience in the dream, the people you meet, the things that happen, the places you see, even your own self which you see in the dream, the guy walking around in the dream, you saw yourself. All that is false. It is understood by the wise to be false. Why? Because, he says, because it's within the body. Within the body. Because of the limited space within the body. It, it, very simple reason, but you see. He will give reasons of time and space and causation, which show that the dream cannot be true. At least not in the same sense it, this waking is true. So one is that space. An argument from space. What does he mean? Sarva Bhavana means all entities. Which entities? Sapne, in dream. So the people you see and, and all of that. Everything that happens in the events also, they are all false. Why? Antasthanat. Because they are all inside. Inside what? Inside your physical body. In fact, the yoga psychology says that how do dreams happen? They say that the jiva, you, the entity, when you dream, there are some nadi, there are some nerves in which you exist and you move in that nadi. You're, you're, you contract yourself to a certain nerve or system of nerves. That was the understanding. So all that is happening in the dream, the places you're going to, the people you're interacting with, all is within the tiny system, system of neurons. And Shankaracharya makes it more clear. He said, the hills you see in the dream and the elephants that you see in the dream. Here in Manhattan you might not generally see elephants and hills. <laughs> but the buses and the subway and all of that which you see. 
they are too large to be in the body. Now, what, see, what is the argument? The argument is when you wake up, you realize it was all in my head. I was here in the bed and never stirred out of the bed. All of this was simulated, virtual reality in this head. Now, what did I see? I saw um, buses and people and trees and huge apartment, Empire State Building, all of it in this space. So in this space, it must have been a simulation, it must have been imagination, it must have been a construct. The actual things could not have been here because this place is, even if I'm completely brainless, still there's not enough space for fitting in the Empire State Building in here. So this place is not enough. There is a dissonance of space. Later on, he'll bring in time and causation also. I mean, he says that not only is physical space, actually the dream is taking place in a tiny system of nerves, not easy, uh, Shankaracharya will make out. But Gaudapada says, in any case, the dream happened in the body. All the things which happened, you did not walk out with the body and go into the Empire State Building. Rather, you were here in the body, the entire thing was imagined. Since those huge things could not fit into this physical body. So what you saw were not the actual things which, you, which are experienced in the waking state. Hence, it's not real. Do you follow the logic? Mm -hmm. The simple thing is, space does not match. Space requirements do not match. You couldn't have fitted Manhattan into your head, inside this. And the simulation definitely happened in here because you did not actually go out. All those things also will be taken up in the next verse. Um, he will say that, Suppose somebody says, no, I actually went there and I came back and I got into the bed. I sleepwalked or something. So I saw it there. No. Because, he will give examples. If you are woken up, you will not wake up in the middle of the Empire State Building at night. You will wake up in your bed. So you did not actually go there. If you met somebody and you go and ask, last night I met you. You will say, no, I didn't even see you. So none of those things actually happened in the waking world. Therefore, it is correct that it, it did not happen. It's not real. It's all in your head. Because it's all in your head, so it is false. Because it's inside. Antasthana means inside. But remember, they will not let go so easily. They will object. Every little thing has to be clarified. Being inside is not a uh, reason for being false. And he gives an example, Shankaracharya says, suppose somebody says, being inside is not, see, you have to argue like this, absolutely precisely, why? You say, objects seen in a dream are false. Why? Because they are inside. Then, somebody will argue, all the people in this room are false. Why? They are inside the room. Just being inside is not enough. Something is inside something else. So, we are inside the um, building, so are we false? No. So you have to add the further thing, samvitatvena, because of inconsistency in space. Just because you're inside, inside is perfectly all right. If I say human beings are inside this building, you can't say it is a false statement. But if I say the Empire State Building is inside this room, you will say it's not, it's not consistent. Because space is not consistent. So like this, entirety of the dream world was experienced inside. And the space is not consistent. Inside means inside the nervous system. Space is not consistent. So it was imagined or dreamt. You say the dreams are false. I know before this. Now you are confusing me. <laughs> without all this reasoning, I knew the dreams were false. Now with all this reasoning, I am getting doubts. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Somebody said, I remember a long time ago, the, the Swami who is in uh, Singapore, he told us something funny. He said when he came to the training center for monks in Belurmat. Um, he was studying and he went to Swami Nirvanananda, the vice president of the order at that time. And the Swami asked him, so how are your studies going? And this brahmachari novice said, oh, I had firm faith in God before studying all the scriptures. Now I'm not so sure. <laughs> when I just came, after studying all this logic and reasoning and everything, now I'm beginning to doubt the whole thing. And he was just joking. But anyway, so, this is the reasoning. Why this is done is because, say for example, there's some people definitely ask this question. I've, I've myself faced it. They'll say, but dreams are sometimes true. 
uh, have you heard this statement? Dreams are sometimes true. Remember, we are doing philosophy here. We are in the company of uh, the Nayaikas. You have to be very precise when you make statements. Dreams are sometimes true. What do you mean when you say dreams are sometimes true? It means something you saw in a dream happened in the waking state. And therefore, it is true. Not that what happened in the dream is true in itself. It was reflected in the waking state, some event in the waking state. You dreamt of somebody and you met somebody the next day. Oh, the dream turned out to be true. Dream turned out to be true in a predictive sense. It happened in the waking state. Suppose you had not met that person in the waking state. You had met that person in your dreams. You wouldn't say it is true. So dreams by themselves are not true. That much is clear. A story about Swami Nirvanananda, which I have told earlier, I will say that and end today. Um, I have already shared it. Uh, this story, very interesting. I, I heard it long time back when I became a novice. Very interesting story. Swami Nirvanananda who was a vice president of the order. He was a sevak of Swami Brahmananda, the spiritual son of Sri Ramakrishna, uh, the first president of the order. Swami Brahmananda. Now, Nirvanananda ji was, I have seen him when I was a little kid. Uh, I still remember him. Uh, he was a mystic, given to visions and all of that. Before Swami Brahmananda passed away, it's there in the uh, Eternal Companion, the life story of Swami Brahmananda. Before he passed away, you'll see at the end it's there, he blessed everybody. One of his sevaks, assistants who served him, a young monk, came to him towards the end of his life, towards the end of Brahmananda's life. And Brahmananda said to him, you will attain Brahma Jnana, the realization of Brahman in this very life. I bless you that you will attain Brahma Jnana, you will be enlightened in this very life. That young monk was Nirvanananda. And later people asked him. So it was predicted. We read. It's published now. <laughs> that is, we read. You'll be enlightened. So are you enlightened? Have you attained Brahma And he said yes. And, and at that time the monks wanted to keep this in recording. So they had slipped a tape recorder. You know one of those old tape recorders? Under the bed. And I heard the recording. Actual recording. No. <laughs> so he's saying yes. And they asked him. What, so what do you see? And he said I see everything. <laughs> So they had to sort of sheepishly take the tape recorder out. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was a, he was a very, very strange, I mean, an incredibly, uh, incredible old, uh, old Swami. And he told me some things which are uh, personal. I was a little kid. I was just seven or eight years old. But it turned out to be true. Um, incredibly true afterwards. 30 years later. And, I and the amazing thing is I remembered them. I mean, I don't remember anything else at that time, but I remember him. My parents had taken me to him, bow down to him, and you're sitting there in Belur Mat, the room next to Swami Vivekananda's room. And uh, he had these huge piercing eyes, you know, he would like putting you through a CAT scanner. He would, <laughs> he'd look you up and down. Um, so the story goes like this. Uh, when he was the vice president and very elderly, Swami Nirvanananda, one day, the, his assistant, the one who was serving him, was about to, in the morning, was about to wake him up, open the curtains at, in the morning, and, uh, and said, Swami, um, wake up, you're, you're late. And this, Swami got up and said, oh, you know, last night, Swami Brahmananda came to me, dream. Swami Brahmananda, his guru, came to me and said, Shudji, he used to call him Shudji because his name was Shudjo Maharaj, Shudjo. Shudji, have you uh, been to Japan? And I said, no. He said, all right, let's go to Japan. And he took me to Japan. See, it's a dream. He's describing a dream. And then we went to this huge shopping place. In those days, India, he didn't have shopping malls. And then we went inside and he said, Shudji, what do you want? I said, I don't want anything. But then you take something. And then I saw this nice pair of slippers, uh, sandals. And I, I selected it and I, I, I got it and brought it back here. And the assistant, the sevak, said, now Swami, you are caught. Where are the sandals? Show me. Well, see, if, it's, see, if the dream is real, then you should have the sandals to show, right? You brought back the sandals. So where are the sandals? Where, where is the thing that you bought from Japan? And the Swami just grinned and said, it's there. Said, no, you have to show it to me. Other, it's just a dream you had. And he said, no, it's there. Now, just a little later, somebody said, um, one of the Swamis from the Vedanta Society in the United States was visiting Belurmat. 
So he has come to bow down to Swami Nirvanananda because he's the vice president. So this Swami, I don't know which this, who this Swami was, some from one of the centers in the West Coast. He came in and he bowed down to Swami Nirvanananda and he said, Swami, I was traveling from USA to India to Calcutta on the way. The plane stopped. We stopped for a couple of days. I, I stopped over in, in Japan and um, before taking my flight yesterday, I thought I should get something for you and went to the shopping mall and I purchased this pair of slippers for your use. <laughs> and the Swami just looked at it and he looked at the assistant and he said, hmm. <laughs> Okay, a stunning case of a dream being true. How do you explain that? I can't, I can't explain it. That's, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So at that time it was not true, but it was still true, right? Yeah, that's true. So why cannot that be applied for the dream? At that point in time it's not true. In an existential reality at a present moment it's not true, but how can you conclusively say that there is no truth element to it? Mm, I don't understand that. Uh, for instance, we just said uh, in, in dream, dreams are inherently not true. Hmm. Consistent statement uh -huh. made. I'm just just oppositioning that with uh, the fact that when you met Nirvanananji as a child of seven or eight, he told some things about you which you said came true. Yeah. Right. But at that point in time, they were not true, but they came true later. Right. No, but he did not say it was true at that point of time. Also, he just said this this something he said, and it it became a fact. It became and, a fact. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to struggle, I'm struggling with this thing that how can you say that it has no truth element to it? I understand it doesn't have existential reality in present. Right. So if you, like, like I said, you, anything that happens in a dream, um, you um, go to the Empire State Building, <coughs> suddenly you're woken up. You wake up in your bed, you don't wake up in the Empire State Building. So they, obviously you have not gone to the Empire State Building. But that's existential reality. That is what is called truth. All right, but the question is, you are dreaming that you are in the um, uh, Empire State Building now, right? right? It doesn't say anything about, you. your dream is not about going to the Empire State Building seven days later. It's now. And when you're waken up now, woken up now, are you in the Empire State Building? No. Yeah. You, are, you t eat a, a cookie <coughs> and then you eat three cookies in the uh, in dream. When you wake up in the morning, if your blood sugar is checked, will it reflect three cookies or one cookie? One cookie. The point in uh -huh. So it's, it's not, I'm not talking about prediction. I'm talking about the reality. And the monk who asked this question of Swami Nirvanananda, you got the slippers, the sandals in the dream. Where are they? Show me. And then sandals did arrive <laughs> later on. So that's what Swami Nirvananda is saying. But uh, Nirvananda is saying that, see, the sandals are here. So the dreams are, so, so people will say dreams are true, but I'm contradicting that. Mandukya Upanishad is contradicting that. What Nirvana Ji Singh is also is contradicted here. It was an incredible prediction that it came out to be true. Fine. But we are dealing at it at a different level here altogether. I'll come to you. Mandukya says, in spite of that, the dream is not true. If the dream were true, he would have had two pairs of slippers. <laughs> right? If you see, I, I go to a shop and you purchase me a pair of slippers. When I come back, what should I have? One pair of slippers. If you bring me one, one more pair of slippers, then I have two pairs of slippers. In the dream, what, what, what you did, if that was really true, you went to Japan and you got a pair of slippers, you should be able to show me the pair of slippers. And if the Swami brings you another pair of slippers, you should have two pairs of slippers. But instead, what do you have? You have one pair of slippers in the waking uh, world, which you somehow dreamt about happening. Your dream, it was very powerful, predictive capacity it had. It's something that happened in the waking state. So what I'm saying is when you use language like a dream is true, you're not meaning it in the sense that something is true in the waking state. In the waking state, when you say I purchased a pair of shoes from the uh, shop, you mean you've got a pair of shoes now. 
In a dream, when you say, I purchased a pair of shoes in a shop and it's true, it means that when you woke up and later on you went and purchased a pair of uh, shoes or somebody gave you a pair of shoes. It predicted something in the waking state. But it did not, does not, you cannot count it along with the waking state. That is how we are talking about Turiya and the, and the three. Uh, what happens in the waking cannot be count, can, what happens in the dream cannot be counted along with your waking thing. Otherwise, what the pair of slippers Swami Brahmananda bought for Swami Nirvanananda would be a second pair of slippers apart from the one which the Swami from coming from the United States bought. Yeah. So it's not real in that sense. It may have a predictive power. Gaurapada is not interested in predictive powers. It's what is existence real. Yes. Suppose you work, someone is working on a theory and he can't quite get the whole thing together. Yes. Yes. He uh, makes the link that uh, makes the theory. Yes. And, and this theory turns out to be true. Yes. Now, uh, is what he did in the dream uh, false or not true, or is it a, a, uh, a, a connection made in a dream that turned out to be true? Right. It's a connection made in a dream that turned out to be true in the waking world. That's possible. Your, your question is, can real knowledge come in the dream? Yes. For example, Kekule, the uh, benzene compound, we all read about it at school. He dreamt of a snake uh, eating its uh, own tail. Ouroboros. Right? Ouroboros. Yes. And that helped him to make the connection. If I had dreamt about it, I wouldn't have made, made, drawn the menzing. Because, because he's been thinking so deeply about it for days and months and years maybe. And then the thing clicks in the dream state. And he gets an insight. But what Gaudapada would say, congratulations on your insight. But there was no snake there eating its tail. <laughs> it was a representation in your mind, which helped to make the connections in your mind. And the knowledge you get... See, the knowledge you get is at the level of the mind. The dream is also at the level of the mind. Nobody denies that you dreamt something. But did it physically happen in the world? No. But do, can you get knowledge? Yes, knowledge is in the mind. You can make connections in the mind. The mind is active in the dream. You might make connections. A lot of those connections might be trash. They might not actually work in the world. But some of them might be actual breakthroughs. Not only knowledge, scientific knowledge. Spiritual knowledge also can come in the dream. <laughs> So many people have got initiation, initiation. mantra diksha in the dream. Yeah. So the uh, Holy Mother comes and they meet and they talk and uh, she gives mantra diksha. What Gaudapada would say that you got the mantra diksha but you didn't actually physically go there and meet uh, uh, the Holy Mother. The transmission was done in your mind. But physically there was, you were actually still there in the bed and sleeping. So that's the point. The approach of Vedanta is to strictly stick to the facts. Mm -hmm. Yes. The space, I mean, the, the point that you were making earlier was that there isn't like the, the space concept. Yeah. There, there's no space in the brain for the size of the empire. Space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But knowledge is also vast. Like that connection is also vast. Can't you say, yeah. therefore, that that's But it's not uh, vast in the physical <laughs> sense. So, like, if you conceive of um, the universe, a galaxy, it's not a physical galaxy in, in, the, in the neuron. It's your neuron thinking about a galaxy, in, in, in your thoughts in the mind. So it's not physical space, right? So you can dream about it, but you can't force an actual physical object into a neuron. Yes. I'll, I'll come to you. Yes, there was a question here. I'll come to you. Yeah. So sorry, we've discussed this before too, that the dream state can be as real or as unreal as the waking state. In some way, it's a parallel stage. stage yeah. Hmm. Hmm. And you have a Sutra Sharif in the dream world, hmm. and the Sutra Sharif goes back and forth. Hmm. So the whole concept of these things need to exist in your brain, the Empire State Building, no longer needs to be true. Because true. they're two parallel worlds, and the Empire State Building exists in the other world, hmm. and your mind went there, right. and your mind came back. And I mean, you can say, why did it come back to one space, why does it go to many spaces, but you can come up with logic to make all that happen too. True, true. But, you know, uh, there's a I mean, principle of the principle of economy. They call it uh, Occam's razor. 
the simplest explanation is probably the best one. Also, for example, why can't I say that my mind went to another world in which um, I had a different body and in which there is a Empire State Building? But the point is, if you're woken up, it comes back in a second. Comes back in a second. <laughs> so all all of that you'll have to think about it that way. Yeah. Of our uh, yes, what, what, what Gaurapada is doing is, that might, you can think in that way, but what Gaurapada is doing it, remember, all of this Vedanta we are studying, it's good to remain rooted. So all of this Vedanta we are studying, we are studying in the waking state. <laughs> so okay. It's a waking state and based on our experience. I yes. Mean, how many of us have this experience of parallel universes? No, but the, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a possibility. That, that's a that's a possibility. So we are we are rooting ourselves in the waking state and then looking back upon our experiences in dream. So we are analyzing the dream state from the waking state. What you are seeing is also a strand of thought in uh, Advaita Vedanta. Uh, Gaudapada will himself use such arguments when it comes a little later. But we'll just hold that in abeyance. Because many of the objections will come up, he will answer. See, differences between waking and dreaming. He will try to reduce all our waking experiences into dream experience. I mean, the difference he will try to obliterate. And when we rebel against that obliteration, we say, no, waking is more real than dreaming. Then he will ask us, what are your reasons? Why are you saying waking is more real than uh, dreaming? When we give the reasons one by one, he will cut down all those reasons. And one of the techniques he will use for cutting it down, he says, something like this. It could just as well be in a dream state that you are asking this question and uh, everything, all the reasoning is being done in dream state and you can snap out of it and wake out of it and see the whole thing was false. And one Swami in uh, the Himalayas, he put it this way very powerfully. He says, many years pass in your dream. Many years have passed. Suddenly you wake up. You, you visited many lands um, and over a span of months and years, suddenly you wake up and see that you are on your, on your little cot, on your bed, in your little, little room. Now he asks, which is more powerful, the years that passed in the dream or that one second of waking up? Which cancels the other one? The one second of waking up, it, because it brings with itself the knowledge that was not, this is. Which is more powerful? The vast lands that you visited in the dream or that little room you woke up in? That little room you woke up in. The person in the dream who tells you all this is an appearance, though everything goes to tell you it's real. When you wake up, all the information that you gathered through your senses, was that more powerful or the words of that one person who told you that all this is an appearance? That were words of that one person are more powerful, more important. Because um, usually... Usually, d waking up from a dream brings with itself a corrective knowledge. Oh, this was a dream. I, I, was, I was sleeping. It brings with it itself. Remember, in the dream, we do not have that. When you go into a dream, you don't remember your waking state. That I was in the, in the, on the bed, now I have come elsewhere. If you remember your waking state, your dream is usually bound to collapse. Your waking state. Yeah. That's why they compare it to an error. If you are aware of the two worlds together and you can switch back and forth, you can get very confused. Uh, uh, like uh, the Chinese philosopher Chuang Tzu, who said, who was dreaming that he was a butterfly, woke up sleeping under a tree. So, Chinese philosopher, and nicely under a tree he was sleeping, he got up and then he said, Am I a, a philosopher? Am I a, but a philosopher dreaming is a butterfly or a butterfly dreaming that he's a philosopher? You had a question. What did Holy Mother mean by this when she said that the dreams of gods and goddesses are true? Why did she say that? In this sense, that it gives spiritual knowledge. Yeah. So that's it for today. Yes, I'll come to you. Um, you know, you when you were giving that uh, example of fire smoke. Yeah. Mm. So, and you haven't uh, described that in your right column there. You have put a question mark. Yeah. And uh, my my question is, is that um, you know when 
when you were saying in the modern era, you don't, you can have fire without smoke. Not only really modern era, in uh, ancient era, so, the, the, so. in, in Nyaya philosophy, they discussed case. What about a heated iron ball, glowing hot iron ball? So there's no smoke there, probably not, and it's f full of fire, that ball, yeah. Okay. Because, you know, in modern parlance, it's like a necessary or a sufficient condition. Yeah. So, you know, if you, if you require the smoke, it's a sufficient condition for having a fire. Yes. It's not necessary. Necessary. So here in this, uh, in the right column also, Mm, this column. Yes. This is not related to this. This is the example. This is the. This is the. This is to do do with the universe and uh, falsity of the universe. Right. Yeah. So what are you asking? My question is, you can as similar to you can have fire without smoke. Here, you have not described it yet. You put a question mark there. But in the uh, Mandukya framework, hmm. would you need that smoke? Do you require that so at no. all? Do you require that placeholder at all in this question? Do you require the why? That's yeah. the why. Oh. Why true? Yeah. Why true? Yeah. Why is it? Why is the world false? Yes. If I say to you just now, the world is false, you'd ask why. Why are you saying that? Won't you ask? We consider the world to be true. We consider this waking world to be true. At least outside the Vedanta class, we do. We consider this waking world to be true. Now, Gaudapada insists that it's false and I'm going to show you it's false. Then they said, we, we, are, we are saying, well, we are game. Show us. To show us, he must give reasons. He can't just say it's false. Even here, to show the fire. See, there is smoke coming out of an apartment. Let us see the context. What are we trying to do? We are trying to get knowledge of the fire there. By the smoke, we infer the fire. If there's no smoke, there is no question of anything because we can't see the fire also there. There is smoke, therefore we say there is fire and we go with the fire engine. Now the question here is, how do you know that there is fire? That's the question. This is called inferential knowledge. If you see fire, finished. There's no need for Nyaya, logic. But if you do not see the fire and yet you are claiming there is fire, why? Why are you claiming there is fire? Then you can claim there is fire anywhere. What, what is the mark? What is the sign? What is the cause for claiming that there is fire? I, I claim that there is fire on the hill or let's say in that um, apartment in Manhattan because I see smoke pouring out of the windows. That's how people function. That's how you get inferential knowledge. Otherwise you can't claim that there is fire. There may be fire without smoke there. You never know. But the thing which we are interested in is smoke is pouring out. What does that mean to us? There is fire there. Then you ask the question, well, how do you know? What's the connection? The connection is, wherever there is smoke, there is fire. How did you come to that connection? But actually, we saw the two together all the time. We have seen it That's in it. kitchens and in different places where there is smoke and fire together. Somebody is smoking. We see fire and smoke together. So, we have established a connection. Now, when you see one part of that, one term of that connection, you infer the other one is there. Just like science, you get data from instruments. With that data, you make an inference. You don't actually see atoms or electrons. You don't see them. You get data, particle accelerators. What does particle accelerators they, they just collect huge amounts of stati statistical data. And on that, you make inferences. Unless you have the data, on what basis will you make an inference? Unless you have the smoke, how will you say there is fire in that particular apartment? Unless you give a reason, why should I accept the falsity of the world when it seems true to me? You have to demonstrate it. Have I answered? Uh, is this, is, was this your question? Because I was kind of stuck on when you said, you, know, you, you mentioned that you can have fire without smoke. Oh, because, so because yeah, yeah. But, 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 but remember, that's a, I was discussing something else there. The point there was that you have to be careful in logic. Wherever there is smoke, there is fire, does not mean the opposite. That wherever there is a f uh, fire, there will be smoke. Yeah. So that, that's where, you know, you, if it's, it's just a sufficient condition for having... Fire. Yes, but here we have to demonstrate the falsity. We need a reason. Some causes may not be this quite clear. Yeah. yeah. There might be other causes. Oh yes, they will give many causes, but they, they, they will show some causes here. So that's the whole chapter. That's what it, the chapter is about. They will build up those causes and... 
like smoke and what is the cause for what do you see in this waking world which leads you to infer it is false that's what we are asking we are asking god apart what do you see here show us why do you think it is false what's the crime? what is the so for example in the dream world why do you think everybody says it's false but why so one example one thing he said was samritatvena hetu now the word hetu was used hetu means the cause the cause is insufficient space there is a contradiction there you have a building which requires tremendous space and yet you are forced to say i imagined it it was it was there in that little nerves so it it must have been imagined it couldn't have an actual building couldn't have been there yeah all right last question uh, mahat uh, probably this this is a question based on other classes so in the deep sleep state when the mind is not having any wishes hmm. we are having blissful and happy state when there is no bliss uh, though it is the source of all jagrat of faith ignorance so except samadhi is there any other worldly goal or worldly state that can give us as much bliss as like the deep sleep deep sleep is a worldly state uh like worldly means like waking state in the waking state yeah um samadhi except samadhi except samadhi okay uh, a deep state of restfulness peacefulness calmness some people take drugs and tranquilizers and <laughs> yeah they, no, they do they, that is the purpose yeah. that's the purpose to stop thinking those who take tranquilizers and other things like that mm. sure somebody pointed out that um, uh, some people shoot themselves have you noticed they shoot themselves in the head mm. there's a reason they want this to stop Uh, sometimes uh, very very agitated people so uh, yeah so there might be different states um, a state of um, say sublime peacefulness when you see beautiful nature um profound satisfaction for a few moments when you have achieved something great in many ways when you come to a state of serene quietness but it gets very disturbed very easily in the waking state a simple blankness also that also might be there but why is there some reason why you're asking this so i was asking that uh, is there any other goal what we are pursuing other than this concentrated one pointed mind any other worldly goal in the jagrat of faith yes knowledge more than concentrated one pointed mind the point to be what are we doing here we are not trying to get a concentrated one pointed mind concentrated one pointed mind is the pursuit of patanjali yoga the pursuit here is knowledge knowledge of turiya by by analysis yeah. concentrated one pointed mind very helpful scattered mind not helpful but the point is not a concentrated mind you go to um, a class in columbia university the point is to understand the physics and the maths which is being taught there the point is not to be very concentrated and you can't tell the professor don't talk i'm very concentrated don't don't disturb <laughs> you know no so here the the point is knowledge